so if I want to I can post it up afterwards for some odd reason your audio is gone I'm not hearing you right now not sure why Hi folks, good evening. Thank you so much for joining me, um, for sharing, you know, your time this Sunday afternoon with me. We had a really, really, really good show on Friday with the single mothers, the single ladies. And I wanted to take this opportunity to again thank the women who took part in that show because it blew my mind. It was even better than I thought it was gonna be. And um, I'm still getting feedback from persons who would have looked at it and felt that, yeah, this was, you know, really, really, really a, 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 a great show. So today we have lined up for you the Minister of Tourism and he is currently in my green room. I am I am put you on screen yet, so don't flash, don't flash the smile yet. Wait to flash the smile. <laughs> right, try not to don't waste the smile on me. <laughs> you wanna save the smile for the audience. You could strips at me and smile at them. <laughs> you know everybody likes your strips, right? Um but before I jump into to, to the minister, I wanted to play this clip from the press conference yesterday because this part of the clip I ain't gonna lie I get excited when I hear about all them vaccines um I think by Thursday of this week more Sinopharm vaccines are going to be in the country they didn't give a specific number but it's I'm hearing that it's a significant number of vaccines and then August 800,000 Johnson and Johnson vaccines I was like <laughs> Johnson and Johnson vaccines one shot maybe I should wait for that one shot vaccine but I will try and get the, the Sinopharm vaccine sooner than the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Why? Because of this particular statement. Today, we are going to alert you to what we're going to do in the next, hopefully, and this is barring any flare-up or any general misconduct, population wise providing we stay on this track yesterday I met with a team of our ministers and Caribbean airline that's our national airline that has been on the ground now for a year and how many heavily funded by you the taxpayer but we've preserved it and just as we were in mid-march about to take some decisions as to what we do about the border closure. We've had that discussion yesterday, and I hope we get a better result this time. In the coming days, probably on Tuesday, the team, health, and other relevant personnel would meet with Caribbean Airlines because it's the government's position that within the next four to six weeks, we would do away with the border closure arrangement and the exemption system because as we vaccinate and as vaccination has accelerated you see that we will do away with the exemption policy and border closure i had to lie down after i hear that because i couldn't understand it so when this clip came to me afterwards i played the clip the clip several times then I messaged all of my family in other parts of the world and send the clip for them. And everybody messaged me back, Rhoda, what that mean? And I said, it means that once you've got your vaccines and once our numbers are fine, the borders can open back up and Toot Moon could come home, visit, spend the money here, and I will be able to travel. Just so happens that the person who is responsible for things like tourism, culture and the arts is someone that I'd spoken to earlier on in the week and said, 
we need to have a conversation. I need to have you here on my live so that we can talk about culture and we could talk about tourism and your plans. So this all worked in lovely for me. When I, when I was like, oh, there's so many questions I can ask Minister Mitchell. And Minister Mitchell is here to answer my questions. Hi, you're on screen now. Hello. Let me give you... Are you hearing well? I am hearing you. Hopefully I'm hearing you. Ho hopefully they're, 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 there's not going to be any oddness with the um with the sound. I want to fix your name because you just have it as your um, your first name. And I don't want people to feel that, you know, as only call it by your first name. There we go. Hopefully I have it. Yes, we've got it fine. Mm -hmm. Right. So, Minister, there are a number of questions that I've got here for you. But first, this is your first time here. Let me say welcome. Good evening. Yes. Good evening, Rhoda. Good evening, Good evening. Good evening Minister. To, to everybody who is on the live. Mm -hmm. um, finally. Yes. Finally, I've made it onto your show. Finally. After banging on the door for so long. <laughs> finally, I have made it onto your show. I well, you know me. I have I have high standards. It's not just any, yeah. you know, not just any and everybody, you know, you know, can't have riff -raff yeah. coming through here. So I was going through the applications, right? I saw your application. I put it on a, you know, a pile, a pending pile, and eventually, as things came around now, and I decided, well, okay, tourism and culture. But no. I'm glad to have you here. It's been a while. We've been trying to iron out our schedules and get everything to sync so that we can have um, a conversation. And I feel it came at the right time, to be quite honest. Yes. It came at the right time. Because when I spoke to you at the start of the week, you were very, very eager. And I remember I was trying to push you off to next week, Friday. And you said, what yes. happened to Sunday? <laughs> And then it turns out yesterday, the Prime Minister made this announcement about the opening of the borders and um, the removal of the exemption. And I, after that, I thought, oh, thank goodness, I have the Minister of Tourism here um, on, on Sunday. So let me get yeah. into the questions. There were a, a lot of questions, a lot of tourism questions. But I want to remind persons that you are also the Minister for Culture and the Arts. Yes? Yes, yeah, of course. Yeah. All right. So it's a... It's a portfolio that i feel can feed into each other but i also see that you know it, it it can be a pretty hefty um pretty hefty portfolio so where do i want to start let me start with something general one of one of the listeners one of my my, my frequenters asked if you could outline what are the plans because the person is saying now that the two ministries are joined what are the plans ahead for the ministry and are there going to be any considerations for collaboration between um, the both parts of the ministries to to promote each other's sector? So, like, will culture be promoting tourism, and will be tur and will tourism be promoting culture? I guess. Well, of course. Um, well, immediately, all the the plans or the policies, etc., that we would have been planning for prior to the pandemic mm -hmm. all of those things came to somewhat of a halt okay the plan right now with respect to tourism is preparing for the reopening mm -hmm. and the reopening is totally dependent on confidence okay it's confidence for those in the travel industry for travelers confidence in the host country and all of that depends on of course vaccination mm -hmm. how safe do people feel to travel mm -hmm. so right now um and that's one of the things that i sent you uh, just before this interview mm -hmm. the ministry had been working on over the, the last few months uh, very comprehensive health and safety protocols mm -hmm. the ministry has also been working with uh carfa mm -hmm. as well as uh, the wttc the world travel and tourism um, council mm -hmm. in terms of rolling out some of those uh, health and safety protocols mm -hmm. so at present we are working with all the tourism stakeholders in the accommodation sector yeah um, arts entertainment um, in our performance spaces we've rolled out a number of those protocols uh, because it's extremely important that we are recognized as being a very safe and healthy destination in mm -hmm. light of the, the, the pandemic because that is what 
travel is going to rely upon. So that is one of the things that we've been working on. And I think we are, we are somewhat advanced with the indication that we're going to prepare for the, for the border opening. Of course, what that means and the, the, the six week period um, gives Caribbean airlines a chance to also develop and put into place their health and safety protocols. So don't, I, don't, I don't want you to rush past that, that too much because that is actually something that I wanted to, 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 to yeah. ask you a question about. This four to yeah. six week period that the prime minister mentioned, what or how is Cal, and I guess to some extent the airport's authority, what are they putting in place to make it so that if and when the airports are reopened, people can feel confident to travel and come back in through our borders? Yeah, well, to their credit, the airport authority, as well as Caribbean Airlines, they have been working on those health protocols. And I'm not sure if you 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 may have missed um, an announcement several months ago mm -hmm. where the the airport and the airport authority got the airport as being certified. Mm -hmm. um, I missed that. I think this, what are this certified for what? Certified in terms of the health and safety protocols okay. uh, through CARFA mm -hmm. and Caribbean Airlines as well. Um, you know, the, there is a, a, a body mm -hmm. that treats with all air travel, etc. IATA. They have also produced several standards where airlines, airports, and all of everything in the travel industry, um, the air travel industry would have to subscribe to and ensure that those protocols are in place. Right. So then yeah. this this is some this is international standards. So that means that anywhere anybody right. So that means we we're covered with respect to that. There's not going to be problems with us meeting criteria for other airlines. Because we've talked about Cal, but I'm sure that Cal won't be the only airline that will be operating once the, the there's there's an easement with the border restrictions. Yeah. Yeah. And and to Cal's credit Cal has been extremely proactive, and I think that they are very much ahead of the curve right. in terms of yeah. putting those protocols in place. But Cal is currently, even though it's not um, operating out of the Port of Spain, well, the Piaco Airport, it's Cal, Cal is still currently doing some some flights. They, they, they still have some routes, right? Yeah, yeah so they, they travel from Port of Spain to Guyana four mm -hmm. times a week, Yeah, and they also travel uh, throughout the Caribbean. Okay, all right. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear about the, the, the international certification. If I can yeah. ask you to jump back to prior to the pandemic starting so that we have a yeah. sense of what would have been the things um, coming into that you were on the cusp of putting in place. Okay, so you, from, from the period 2016 till now, we have been in a process of reorganizing our tourism sector. Right. Um, if I speak to tourism. Um, so in 2016, we took some very serious decisions in terms of shifting our policy. Um, one of those very serious decisions um, in terms of shifting the policy was to split the destination marketing and management mm -hmm. for the both destinations, um, Trinidad and Tobago, and to also have in place a committee where um, Trinidad can work with Tobago in terms of um, sharing several advantages. The other, the other um, major shift in policy was to, of course, focus in terms of Trinidad on the four niches. Mm -hmm. So we've identified four niches in terms of Trinidad mm -hmm. and focused on that. What are those the four, four niches? niches Mm -hmm. The four niches being ecotourism, mm -hmm. sport tourism, mm -hmm. mice, which is otherwise known as business tourism, mm -hmm. and events tourism, which festivals, carnival, etc. What about conferences? Those are the, yeah, so that, that falls under mice, because mice actually stands for meetings, incentives, conferences, and exhibitions. Okay. So we just generally call it uh, business tourism. Right. Right, so so those were some of the two major policy shifts. Mm -hmm. um, and in terms of uh, Trinidad, we have been working towards redeveloping, revising our tourism policy 
that tourism policy is in its final stages in draft form mm -hmm. uh, soon to be taken into to, to cabinet and it's published on our website tourism.gov.tt yeah and as well um the ttl that is the the trinidad based tourism marketing company mm -hmm. they are as they are as well building their marketing capability and capacity all right minister if In i can of, yep. if i can slow you down here and yep. just ask a couple and ask at least one question about each of the sectors ecotourism if you can shed some yep. light on what you were thinking of doing with respect to ecotourism prior to the pandemic well i mean we we have uh a rich set of flora and fauna here. I mean, mm -hmm. we have the, the Karani Swamp. There is the, the uh, Asa Wright Nature Center. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a, a, a massive amount of nature lovers, birders, as we call them, bird watchers, who come down to Trinidad as well as to Tobago, because in Tobago, there are a number of species that you find there, and mm -hmm. they're alone. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, a niche marketing area that the marketing companies work with the stakeholders to ensure that people, um, that it's very marketable and people can come down here. People are attracted to, to Trinidad and Tobago for that purpose. Okay. What infrastructure are you thinking of using with respect to things like sport tourism and how, and who are you thinking of attracting when you talk about sport tourism? So fortunately, in Trinidad and Tobago, we have some of the most um, most advanced sporting facilities. Um, if I could just take you to that cluster in Coover, mm -hmm. we have the the Atobolan Stadium, we have the home of football, we have the cycling arena, and we have the the swimming arena, if I can call it, the aquatic center, if I can call it that. Mm -hmm. Now, with the way sport tourism works as well as um, another one would be um, the Taruba Stadium, the Brian Lara Stadium, mm -hmm. right? So the way sport tourism works is you work with several of the associations, the cycling association, you work with the, um, the swimming association, you work with TTFA, um, you also work with the cricket association, mm -hmm. right? Trinidad and Tobago Cricket Board. Mm -hmm. So you work with them and uh, you basically partner with them and you, you you support them where they go abroad and they organize these international meets or these international tournaments. Mm -hmm. CPL is, is one such tournament. Um, and, and those attract quite a bit of persons down here for sport. All right. So you're talking about the teams, all the support staff for the teams, um, friends and family of those international team members and it creates quite a bit of economic value when you consider sporting tourism. So, so that's what sporting tourism is about. In 2020, um, COVID-19 took away to the period um, a very important sporting event, which was the Pasha's Meet, the international Pasha's Meet, mm -hmm. where um, the group, the Hashers Association, they went to the um an international meet i believe it was in bali and they bid mm -hmm. for this destination to host the 2020 hashers meet and they actually won um it has been postponed to 2022 but what we expect um we expect about four thousand uh international visitors arriving here mm -hmm. um spending about a week mm -hmm. uh, and that 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 presents tremendous economic value because these these hashers this type of tourist are uh, high spending tourists mm -hmm. so let me stick yeah. up in as we're talking about sport tourism and you looked at that could that cluster there the cluster of um, arenas that would be central south trinidad right because taruba would be a uh, you know south ish um not south <laughs> Yeah, South-ish. I know you're a proper South man, so in your opinion, Taruba ain't South at all. Taruba is on it's your south, way to right? South. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, the question I would have is, because I'm from Central, and I've spent a fair amount of time in South Trinidad, if I was coming from another country to use those facilities, 
where would I be staying? So let's talk about accommodations and what you're looking at in terms of support facilities, support amenities for persons who are going to be using those, um, going to be using the sports centers. Right. So there is actually a, a plan, a proposal to build a hotel mm -hmm. um, in that vicinity because there's also Sevilla, who, who yeah. of course. Yeah. Um, there is a proposal to build a hotel in that area. Um, but for the time being, Cara Suites in Claxton Bay, they benefit tremendously mm -hmm. um, from persons utilizing that cluster. And there are a lot of, of, of small meets that occur there. Um, they don't really gain national attention. But there, prior to the pandemic, there were a few meets that occurred at that aquatic center. Um, but we, we Cara Suites as well as the hotels in Port of Spain. But there was a plan mm -hmm. to, to put a hotel right there in that vicinity um, to really take our sport tourism uh, product mm -hmm. off and running. There also is a, a, a proposal to build a hotel in South Park. Mm -hmm. And that hotel will also serve the, the Brian Lara Stadium. Right. Um, I'm not sure where it is. Of course, COVID-19 threw up everything, but we had been approached by a number of um, investors to put down a hotel at South Park. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Um, oh, and not to mention uh, yeah. Home of Football, TTFA, they, they have some accommodation there as well. Right. Okay, so yeah. so, th so there, there are some possibilities with respect to accommodation in the vicinity of the... Of the um, of yeah. the sporting facilities yes all right i'm gonna come back to hotels eventually but not right now um we're still talking about these the the this which is ba this is basically what i refer to as alternative tourism so with eco tourism i want to go back to acerite and the reason i that i want to go back to acerite is acerite closure during the pandemic last year became quite a thing in the public yep. domain and the organization we know it to be a private organization that eventually became clear that it's not part of the state apparatus in, in in any form or fashion it's here it's a trust in trinidad and tobago it has its own board it functions independently but what's the nature of the relationship or interaction um between your ministry and its ecotourism thrust and acerite at this point in time all right, so since the announcement, um, in terms of closure, it was not as the media portrayed, or if I am to be fair to the media, it's, it's not where persons um, got the impression that they were closing permanently. Mm -hmm. So the ASA Right Nature Center is a, it's run by a trust. Mm -hmm. And the trust is not so much tourism focused. It's really a trust um, created with the objects to preserve the nature, um, the acreage, the birds, etc., and the and the study into those things, the academic study into those things. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a right nature center, um, so they built their their business model on operating for six months for the year. A maximum of six months for the year, right? And the eco tourists or the eco tourism sector, um, they have some really high value travelers. So that trust was run and run in surplus just from operating for six months for the year. And that was all they needed. That was all they needed. That was what the model was built on. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, the, 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 the trust itself doesn't, was not really created for that tourism um, element. However, with the, the COVID-19 pandemic and the shutdown of travel and tourism, it really exposed the business model. And therefore, they had to um, close their doors mm. to the public. So we have a good relationship with um, the members of the trust. They approached us for some assistance, just um, to the extent of assisting in maintaining 
the trust mm -hmm. and in assisting in securing the trust, police patrols, etc. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we have a, a very good relationship with them. What the trust is now exploring, they're exploring having another entity focus on the tourism aspect. Okay. And in extending um, their offerings. So they have quite a bit of acreage up on where they're located. Yeah. Arima. Arima Blanche shares. Uh, yeah, the Arima yeah. Blanche shares. Um, they have quite a bit of, of, of acreage up there, some of which they, they, they don't use. And they are in discussions with um, other entities in mm -hmm. terms of handing off that part of of the operations. Okay, so they they're actually thinking about utilizing other parts of the estate, developing it in a different yes. way. Okay. Yes. But it's yes. not necessarily going to uh, um, affect the preservation part of things because I know that a significant amount of land is supposed to be protected land. Yes, it's it's supposed to be protected. So they are they are going to focus on those that those parts those objects. Um, of the trust in terms of preservation, preservation of the birds, preservation of everything else, and the mm -hmm. the academic um, aspect of the of the operations. Mm -hmm. So they have um, they partnered with with New York New York University. Um, several of the the students from New York University come down. And they stay at the Acer, right? And they, they study the birds and they, they study our world famous oil birds. Mm -hmm. um, okay. They have a pretty good operation. I mean, it, 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 they were doing very well prior to the pandemic. But of course, the pandemic exposed a lot of people's business models. Yes. So yeah. the, the weak areas became became apparent. I'm seeing some yeah. um, one of the counselors from the Arima Bar Corporation saying that uh, um, Acerite didn't actually want to partner with the government. They didn't actually want, you know, huge amounts of support from the government. They wanted to kind of continue to do their thing independently. And the trust um, is hemorrhaging because money is tied up in New York because I think that is where that's where um, their funding is is located. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's so, useful. Yeah, they, they, they didn't want they didn't want any any assistance, any financial assistance. They simply wanted. Mm -hmm. um, assistance, and, and I've spoke to you know, Minister of Public Utilities, spoke to Minister Kazim Hussein, tremendous help, mm -hmm. uh, where we got some, you know, CPAP workers once in a while to come just maintain their trails, um, and Minister of Public Utilities to just maintain the, the lighting, mm -hmm. um, the municipal police from that mu municipality. Um, they are also supposed to be doing some patrols just to ensure that trespassers, squatters, hunters etc stay off the the premises and in the meantime uh, the trust has indicated that you know they will be looking to you know redevelop their their model okay your neighbor is a celine dion fan he is jimmy jimmy <laughs> jimmy is in love and on sundays <laughs> Jimmy sound like he have a tabanka. <laughs> That's what's going on there. He in love. He is a lover. He oh, okay. Lover. okay, okay, okay. Because in the midst of that there, I just heard Celine Dion saying that she was somebody's lady. And I was like, <laughs> oh, what is going on with, La with Randall's musical taste in the back there, boy? Um, thanks for clearing up that whole Acerite situation. Because I know a lot of persons thought that Acerite was linked to the government um, um, tourism infrastructure. And that the government in some form or fashion just wasn't doing its due diligence where acerite is concerned um what did i want to jump to business tourism what are what are what, what were the plans where business where mice sorry where mice tourism was concerned well in, you know in similar vein in 2020 we expected about a thousand visitors um well no just just about when the pandemic happened maybe just one month before the one month after the closure of the borders we were expecting um one of those insurance agent associations to have their conference down here we were working hand in hand with them hmm. and you know that's how it works you know you you develop as you say the infrastructure and you work with the hotels, the conference spaces, you work with the association, um, you work with them, 
most times you you assist them in their marketing you assist them in making their bids to host and you assist them in kind for what i mean by that for example when you have large groups of insurance agents coming down mm -hmm. to participate in the conference PTSC would provide, you know, free transportation. And that is something that the destination would do. Um, at the end of the conference, you know, you arrange tours where you take them to the Pitch Lake or to the Kearney Bird Sanctuary or to Maracas Beach or even to Arapita Avenue. Um, and, you know, you, you, those are the things that you do. So it's, it's, it's all in partnership with these associations, with these um with these associations, with the accommodation sector, with the airlines as well, because sometimes they partner, they come on board and they, they offer um, special packages or special rates mm -hmm. for persons mm -hmm. to, to come down. Um, the Energy Conference is one of our largest, you know, um, but the Energy Conference this year is, is online. It was one of our largest where you have persons from Houston, Guyana, Suriname, persons from all over the world coming down um, to attend these conferences. And what that means for, for Trinidad tourism, um, you have these high paying, high spend type of travelers coming down here and spending their money within our economy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's the name of the game. They, they spend money in, in their hotel, on their hotel rooms, they spend money on entertainment, they spend money on food and beverage, and, and that adds, contributes, if we could say, to, to GDP. Okay, so then let me ask you this question, and this is moving from tourism into arts. And then after I've asked you that question, you've answered that, I'm going to jump back into tourism again, right? Because it just yeah. said it, this will, it will tie in nicely. Persons come here for business tourism. They've done their conference during the day or whatever, or, they've, or the conference is finished and they have an extra day. Because I've done this sort of thing. I've gone somewhere else. And because, and because of how I've scheduled my flight, because I've got a day or two in between, or maybe a half day, I want to go and see something about the place, about the city. Museums. What are we? What are your plans with respect to museums? Not just the National Museum, but also there's been a lot of talk about the Carnival Muse Museum. I know that the policy was laid in Parliament recently, so if you can just shed some light. So yes, there, there's a uh, policy uh, laid in Parliament, and for the last, I'm not sure how many number of years, we've been talking about a Carnival Museum, and that Carnival Museum. Um, was supposed to or is supposed to um, be housed at Fort San Andres. Mm -hmm. Fort San Andres is on South Key, which is opposite to PTSC. So it's mm -hmm. on South Key. I don't know if you know yeah. Fort San Andres. What, what, it yeah. used to be called the, the, the Port of Spain Museum, as a matter of fact. Yes. I, I know where it at is. At one point in time, yeah. So they've vacated and their plans to refurbish that building Mm -hmm. and develop it into a carnival museum that has been ongoing for quite a number of years however very happily some a private outfit has come to the ministry approached the ministry with plans to set up their own carnival museum mm -hmm. which we believe is a win-win for the ministry for the country as well as, as, as those persons who wish to set up that museum. So the bank called Penny Bank. Mm -hmm. I remember the Penny Bank, in yes, Spain. in Port of Spain. It, it, it's owned by, the, by First Citizens, right? First Citizens. Owned by First Citizens Bank. And First Citizens entered into, well, they did an, uh, an expression of interest exercise, um, sending it out to the public sometime in 20, I think it was early 2020. Mm -hmm. and you know just seeking ideas for persons who wish to lease or license the the um that penny bank mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. do whatever and ttcba which is led by rosalind gabriel along with an ngo they had submitted a proposal and that proposal won so the fcb and and you will hear more about it when fcb does their their pr um, campaign um you know 
giving the population an understanding as to exactly what happened and, and you know awarding um national awarding the officially awarding the penny bank to the ttcba and the, the ngo right. so the ttcba they they have a proposal a winning proposal to put a carnival museum in there um, they are receiving support from the First Citizens Bank. Um, they've put a proposal to us. They've put a proposal to National Lotteries Board. They've put a proposal to the Sport and Culture Fund. And at, so they're right now in the planning stages of getting a carnival museum there at the Penny Bank. And the, the, the idea is something that we support. So we feel that it can be a win-win situation where we have a carnival museum Okay, good. And what about the port, the port of Spain? Uh, not port of, port of Spain. Sorry, the National Museum, the la, the large one up at the tennis courts there. Yeah. So, the National Museum, beautiful building. It's a heritage building, um, but the National Museum is in need of some significant refurbishment on the inside. Um, they have quite a number of national treasures, national artifacts under their, um, under their remit, under their charge. And what we're doing right now is looking to see how best we can engage um, somebody like a Udicot to mm -hmm. come in, see what is, what is needed because it's, it's, it's pretty old, it's pretty dated on the inside when you, when you consider uh, contemporary museums worldwide or con con contemporary museum design, internal design. Um, so that's what we're doing presently. Um, the building is also in need of some repair. Um, and of course, there are challenges with respect to, to, to budgets, etc. But that is something that we're working on where the National Museum, the Victorian, is what is what used to be called the Victorian Institute is concerned. Okay. Are there timelines? Uh, at all at this point in time? I mean, I know the pandemic would have thrown things off, but are there timelines for completion, start of any of, of these things? There are no timelines. So right now, we have to put together a proposal, and of course, we're going to have to battle with all other ministries, all other agencies in terms of that financial, that money pie mm -hmm. that occurs mm -hmm. every year in the budget. Um, you know, as you know, the pandemic has really hit our finances and our ability to spend um so you know it's it's a matter of of doing things that are priority um and getting us back to a place of growth mm -hmm. back to a place of where we were pre-pandemic so no i can't give um any timelines but i think the most important thing is that we have you know a really good plan in place um, to take the museum forward to a place, you know, where we where we want it to be. Okay, all right. So that is that is most important, and after that is is a matter of you know trying to get the resources. I hear you on the trying to get the resources, Potter, eh? because I I know that the the revenue situation is a pretty dire revenue situation. I want to jump back now to. There are a couple of things you talked about and words like infrastructure, tourism infrastructure, and of course, ecotourism is still on my mind. Infrastructure for our for our tourist attractions, especially in my it, if what is interesting me right now is our external, our outdoor tourist attractions. And let me itemize, iterate some of the things I'm thinking of. Marcarip. Right, the infrastructure at Macquarie. Let's say the infrastructure for change rooms and those kinds of things for for persons. Mm -hmm. Um, Kuva, uh, Cora, the Cora River. I know for some people, you know, River Lime is in, in you know is entrenched and and they 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 are at rivers on a fairly regular basis and they will need if you have people there cooking lime in facilities yes. and also the Celebia Beach in Toku. I recently spent. A week in Toko. It was a lovely week at the place that I was at in Toko. And I took a drive down because I wanted to see what the the works that was taking place in that area was like and what was taking place at the lighthouse. And let me, whoever's doing the upgrades to the lighthouse, let me say I was very pleased with what I was seeing with the upgrades to the lighthouse. But that beach is looking 
like a bit of a shanty town. There are mm -hmm. all kinds of huts and so let's talk let's start talking about infrastructure at tourist locations and tourist sites. All right. So the Ministry of Tourism one would get the impression that Ministry of Tourism is responsible for um, a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the sites and attractions. Mm -hmm. But that is not so. The Ministry of Tourism is responsible for five locations. That is the Maracas Beach, Manzanilla, Las Cuevas, um, Vesigny, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. the library. There is a uh, a facility on the, the library pitch lake, the museum. Right. Uh, that library pitch lake facility. And that's Ministry it? Of Tourism, okay. And that's it. So the Ministry of Tourism, what you read, what you should read into that when you hear Ministry of Tourism mm -hmm. is that okay. we are responsible for tourism policy as well as the marketing of the destination. There are a number of other agencies that are responsible for tourism sites and attractions across Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, you just mentioned Macquarie Beach. Who's responsible that for Macquarie? The Chagaramas Development Authority. Okay, so I will so go in CDA yeah. skin. I will go in CDA skin. <laughs> you know me. CDA, CDA is responsible for the entire peninsula. Um, the Karani Bird Sanctuary, mm -hmm. that's Ministry of oh. Agriculture, um the you mentioned something else so the the Cora, who is responsible for cora the the the, the, Cora, the Cora would river be, facility Cora, <clears throat> Cora would be the local government uh municipality in that area I think so tuna Pia. puna piaco that tuna would be tuna puna, puna piaco okay tuna puna piaco mm -hmm. um lopino mm -hmm. the estates that would be ministry of agriculture land really? and fishery Okay. Yeah. San Fernando Hill, Ministry of Agriculture, Land and Fisheries. The Lighthouse. The Lighthouse is a split between the Sangre Grande Regional Corporation as well as the Ministry of Works and Transport, who is responsible for the Lighthouse itself. Marine Division. Mm -hmm. Right? Sally Bay. That would be under the responsibility of the Santa Grande Regional Corporation. Okay. In terms okay. of the works going on at the lighthouse, where I, I don't know if you would notice there was a visitor center. Yeah, I noticed. Park, I noticed. Yeah, and we did some and some sprucing up and so on. That is actually done by the Ministry of Tourism. And to get that done, we had to bring all the parties. Um, Ministry of Works, the National Trust, as well as the San Grande Regional Corporation, and have everybody sign an MOU prior to us um, doing the spend and managing the project. And when the project is done, um, it should be handed over, well, the lighthouse itself that remains with the Ministry of Works and Transport, and everything else on that property goes to the San Grande Regional Corporation for its management. Okay. Now, it's, it's, it's an extremely um, important point that you raised, and it's one of the, the revisions to our National Tourism Policy 2021-2030 that I spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. And one of the policy shifts there would be in working with our local government policy reform to place a number of these sites, beaches, etc., formally, under the management of the local government bodies. Mm -hmm. They are the ones who are closest to these sites and also giving them um, that charge where they can also monetize and make sustainable some of these um, attractions. So for example, Devil's Woodyard, that is under the, the Princess Town Regional Corporation mm -hmm. and they have monetized it. Um, I think there is a there is a fee to 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 an entrance fee to get into the Devil's Woodyard, mm -hmm. and they use okay. the proceeds from that to maintain the area. I think the same for Bunsi Trace, that mud volcano. Mm -hmm. So that is the kind of idea that we have in terms of 
our new policy position in placing a number of these sites and attractions under the local government bodies. So if I have questions about that beach up in Toko, is really the Sandy Grande Regional Corporation I have to ask? Sandy Grande Regional Corporation, okay. yes. Okay, all right, good. Because it, it, it the, the, the beach looks really untidy now, you know? It looks like a, a little squatting settlement. I drove past and I thought, I said, well, hey, what is going on here? I couldn't be- Oh, the squat, oh, that one. Yes. That one is, that one is extremely tricky. Mm -hmm. um, so, that's actually private lands. What? That is actually private land. You know what? You know the beach you're talking about, right? I'm talking about the beach the that is town. right. So you're on your way to the lighthouse. So the beach before you get to the lighthouse. Yes. All right. If you're talking about the one where there are a number of squatters and it looks like a, a, a shanty town. Yes, plenty little, puts, plenty little shops and shacks. Right. So that that is actually private land. I don't um, know that. Yeah, they were in talks to, to sell the lands to the government and it was under the UNC and I, I can't tell you what happened there. Mm -hmm. um, it, is in, it is in an estate. Um, the executors of that estate were the ones negotiating for the sale of the land. Um, I think that, that that process had gone to the point of, to, to the Ministry of Lands to try and determine who actually owns and uh, to survey the land, etc. Mm -hmm. But that whole shanty town story, persons went and they set up these little shacks and they rent them out um, to persons wishing to stay there. How they got um, TNTech to connect, that is a different story. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> That is something that I actually wrote the Sangre Grande Regional Corporation about, mm -hmm. um, expressing okay. our dissatisfaction with the state in light of our tourism product. Um, I've not had a response from them, but I, I am not sure. And, and the, the, the municipal corporation, they are the ones to actually to remove persons. Either the municipal corporation has the power to do that, as well as the commissioner of state lands. Um, but more directly, the municipal corporation, they have the power to remove and regulate that situation there. But that, that is what is going on at that beach. And mm. it is such a beautiful beach. It is. And it's got that reef on it. So I, the next question I was going to ask is, are you all not concerned about the impact of all of that squatting on the beach, on the beach itself, on, on, on the reef? Because, I, I mean... I don't know how much of that reef is still alive, but I, what what we've got there, we should try to preserve. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, that that was part of the concern because I mean, it's, it's not an area that is sewered. No, it's not a. That's why it smells so awful now. <laughs> All right. Okay. So then, let me ask this question about um, development of three new hotels. There were supposed to be three new hotels: the Radisson Blue, the Bricks Hotel by Marriott, and Comfort Inn Suites, or something like that. And th were those yeah. hotels meant to come on stream? Any updates about those hotels? Yeah, those hotels were supposed to to come on stream by the second or third quarter of 2021 mm -hmm. i think the, mm -hmm. the bricks is is very much advanced the last time i visited um they were just outfitting that hotel the radisson blue similarly they were just outfitting um i've not visited or received an update on the comfort in but they were moving a piece okay what i suspect what i suspect is that they were just slowing things down somewhat um, in time for the reopening of the borders. But those hotels, um, very happily, we, we expect them to come on stream in 2021. And it's as a result of the, the ministry, part of the ministry's remit, Ministry of Tourism, is to encourage investment through the Tourism Development Act. Mm -hmm. And that is just what we did. Um, so those hotels have received considerable exempt, uh, incentives um incentives such as tax exemptions so they would have been given a, a seven-year tax holiday yeah and mm -hmm. as well they've they've gotten some duty-free concessions in terms of outfitting those hotels 
So that, that's part of the, the ministry's remit, and we're very happy to, to announce the coming of those three brand new high quality hotels, high quality hotel rooms. Okay. Right okay. now, um, you would also notice that eTech, they also put out uh, an expression of interest. Mm -hmm. um, sometime, I believe it was last month, or month or two months ago, where they sent out an EOI. Um, requesting investors to submit their expressions of interest in Rockley Point, that is in Tobago, to put down a high quality hotel or hotel development. And we've received considerable interest and it's now going to the RFP stage. That is being handled under the Ministry of Trade and ETEC, because ETEC are the holders of the land. So that is some more exciting news hmm. for the island of Tobago. Um, we've had some, of course, we have been working for the last, well, since 2018, 2019 on the Magdalena and getting an operator for the Magdalena. And it was on the cusp of being signed off by the Apple Group. Yeah. But COVID-19 happened and of course everybody pulled away um, for the time being also the the old turtle beach resort mm. that had been acquired by sunwing and we were busily pr processing the the application for incentives because that project um, entailed a redevelopment of the entire hotel mm -hmm. uh, as well as putting in a uh, five-star condo development attached to that hotel but again that was shuttered somewhat because of the COVID-19 pandemic mm -hmm. so that's that's where we are with respect to attracting investment and developing the accommodation sector okay I've forgotten what the, the, was the next question I wanted to jump to with respect to Okay, so we've covered the hotels. There was something I wanted to get back to you. And this. Oh, I wanted to shift to um, our entertainment sector. I saw yeah. that one of the things you're looking to do now is, is prioritize the vaccination of uh, um, performers. Olatunji mm -hmm. Yearwood was just on the thread and he was asking, if someone has to do a performance, let's say they're performing on a Saturday, so it's a bit of maths here, right? So 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 bear with me. They're performing on a Saturday, they do their PCR test to be able to travel and they're coming back into the country on the Sunday. Do they need to do can they travel on that same PCR test? You, you understand what I mean? So you know you're supposed to take a you're supposed to take a PCR test just before you travel. Right? You have a 72 hour period. So basically he's yeah. asking if the PCR test if uh if the sorry the travel falls within that 72 hour time frame of the negative pcr test can he come back into the country on the same negative pcr test so he do the test maybe i guess the thursday he traveled the friday he performed the saturday he come back the sunday i think that's what he's asking yeah i i wouldn't want to venture i guess okay it may very well be so mm -hmm. um I don't know. That is not something within our control. That's something that's set by the the airline itself, mm -hmm. as in in collaboration with the Ministry of Health um, or whatever health agency in the host country. Mm -hmm. So I, I wouldn't want to venture a guess. Okay, fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm once he's listening, I'm sure he would have heard that, so he can check with the airlines. He can check with the Ministry yeah. of Health. What can and you? If you, if you if you remember, if you remember the Prime Minister's um, statement that you played uh, prior to mm -hmm. us talking yeah um the prime minister announced that the relevant officials from the ministry of health caribbean airlines etc will meet on tuesday and all of those things all of those matters will uh, be thrashed out protocols, those things will be thrashed out so that caribbean airlines comes with some definitive protocols and criteria for travel one of which may very well be that um maybe that you have to travel vaccinated right to, to come into the country 
you need to be vaccinated. Right. Um, if not vaccinated, however, you may have to go through some sort of exemption or some more rigid quarantine period. So those things will be thrashed out by those experts and they will be related to us in, in due course. Okay. Um, is there anything further you wanted to be able to outline with respect to the vaccination uh, um, initiative for creatives? So, yeah, all weekend we're busy calling a lot of the creatives, those who are interested in being vaccinated. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, we expect tentatively on Wednesday mm -hmm. at the UTT campus in Kuva, we have a number of our creatives um, who will be vaccinated. And of course, a lot of the creatives, they have indicated that, you know, they're willing to do some endorsements. Mm -hmm. So we're working okay. along with TTT and um, Minister De Nobrega, Ministry of Communications, mm -hmm. in de developing a campaign um, to encourage persons to become vaccinated. Okay. Um, so okay. we're doing that tentatively on Wednesday. Uh, quite a number of creatives have been vaccinated. And some creatives are actually have actually traveled. They've taken the risk. And they've traveled and they've become vaccinated um, in the U.S. Right. So that is another part of the program that was recently announced. Um, to leave, to depart, you don't need to be vaccinated, but we encourage you, of course, to go abroad and get your, your one shot. Yes. Make sure that you are vaccinated before returning. Okay interesting yeah. all right um yeah. anything else with respect uh, uh, is la last year you all had managed to do some sort of support you know a sort of subvention from the state for creatives is there any op is it will is there the opportunity for something like that right now well the, i mean the creatives along with those tour operators persons in the in the tourism industry mm -hmm. um they are not prohibited from applying for SME help mm -hmm. or income support. Mm -hmm. um, so last year, government announced uh, a $25 million grant initiative, um, the, the cultural relief grants, where persons in the creative sector were encouraged to apply for a, a one-time $5,000 grant. I mean, mm -hmm. we understand that $5,000 can't really go that far mm -hmm. um we were encouraged and the creatives were encouraged um in november december fast forward to to march where the entertainment industry had reopened somewhat um mm -hmm. to limited capacity mm -hmm. so we 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 had a dip in terms of applications for that grant so out mm -hmm. of the 25 million dollars we expended about 18 about 18 million dollars in grant funding mm -hmm. um of course we expect now that persons are going to, to to reapply for the grants um as i said you know it was very encouraging that we were able to to reopen the sector in some, on some limited basis but of course we're now in the state of emergency Mm -hmm. and considerable restrictions where we have gone back to the restrictions on gathering, the restrictions on outdoor entertainment, the restrictions on ent entertainment, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so that is where we're at. Uh, that is why we saw this opportunity to assist artists in getting their exemptions to come back. Those artists, those creatives who um, may receive invitations or bookings to take gigs up in those north american cities yeah uh, where they have that ability to earn some money so as we're all aware in those north america in north america they're extremely advanced in their vaccination campaign so maybe about 60 to 70 percent of their populations are vaccinated mm -hmm. and their their entertainment industries their entertainment sectors are reopening so much so that, you know, Labor Day is on, Miami Carnival is on. Mm -hmm. uh, just this weekend gone, Memorial, Memorial Day weekend, there were a number of events in, in New York, Miami, and Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, so our creatives have opportunities. Some creatives um, just, they took the risk and they, they left. Um, but we are now proposing, we propose, cabinet has accepted um, a program where 
creatives can leave, take up their bookings, and not have to go through the discomfort of applying and waiting for um, an exemption. Okay. So we are putting okay. some predictability into the into the whole. So um, they don't thing. have to worry about when they're going to get back into the country. They can no, act. Okay. No, no. So we, we have liaison officers at the Ministry of Tourism um, who would be working with the Ministry of National Security to ensure that those creatives, when they're done with their performances, instead of having to book a hotel and just wait indefinitely and, and of course, consume a lot of the, the money that they went up there to earn, mm. um, no, we're putting some predictability so they don't have to go through the anxiety and the discomfort of just waiting indefinitely so that they can come back in good time. Okay, and that's that's wonderful to hear because for me, I, I have considered traveling, but it's the unpredictability of being able to return that has me con that would ha that would have me concerned. Um, can we jump? And that over of course is in, in the time for the time being until of course the borders um, are reopened and the exemption policy has changed. I get yes. you. I get you on that entirely because I sus I suspect by the time the exemption policy has changed. What then happens is you book your flights to go and to return like like normal, like one would yeah. normally do. Can we head but over to something, the... Sure. But there is okay. something about that um, that whole plan that we've discovered that perhaps we should leave something similar in place to assist persons in the entertainment sector or cultural workers mm -hmm. so that any question that they have with respect to leaving, with respect to coming back, with respect to anything that we can at the ministry have that line open to assist persons cultural workers okay. so I, I think that that is the good thing that will come out of that okay well, good to know never anything. yeah okay. now we have more ferries on the high seas than we have maxi taxis on the pbr i mean i feel some days i could just go and stand up on maracas or las cuevas and flag down a ferries like how many how many how many into ireland ferries we have now about five no three four somewhere thereabouts about, about four, yeah. About four, right? <laughs> Galleon's Passage, um, the TNT Spirit, the Boko Reef, and the APT James, of course, the Boko Reef being the, the newest one. But I think the TNT Spirit will be taken out of commission. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I've heard talks to, to redeploy the Galleon's Passage in another capacity. Okay. Yeah. In another but capacity? Yeah, in another capacity, but let's let the minister of works speak about that. So don't ask. So you're trying. You're trying to say don't ask, yeah. Don't ask. Me. So you're you're basically you're basically trying to tell me no, that I should try and reach out to Minister Sinanan and ask him if he will speak. I'm, to I'll tell you why I've asked that question because yeah. one of the questions thrown at me today to throw at you is whether or not our government mm -hmm. is speaking to any of the other regional governments mm -hmm. about an inter-regional ferry like we the ferry leave here and i guess get to me you know if it's barbados or grenada and then from there you could take another ferry or something so is there any is there any conversation like that taking place at any level i mean i i am not aware of any firm conversations taking place um at the regional level of course the prime minister for the time being he is the chairman of caricom mm -hmm. um so if it's if it's being discussed it may very well be discussed at that level Right. But I have not heard of any concrete plans to do a regional ferry. Um, but the Galleons Passage, for now, I mean, those those brand new boats will have to be taken out of service um, for a short period of time. For maintenance? Uh, for maintenance and, and for servicing. And, and that's where the Galleons Passage, for example, would, would fill in. Mm -hmm. um, oh. so, so we have those three on the sea bridge. Um, but yeah, congratulations to the Ministry of Works and Transport. Um, in tourism, of course, a, a large part of the government's role in tourism is transportation. Yes. Right? Transportation, we, we own the, the, the airline um, and, of course, transportation on the air and sea bridge. So we have just put um, over a billion dollars worth of brand new state-of-the-art ferries on the sea bridge. And, you know, it's going to, to do well for the sea bridge in terms of, you know, predictability, efficiency on the sea bridge. No longer should there be any complaints. And, you know, the, the tourism operators, both in Trinidad and Tobago, need to understand and, and, and utilize the ferry. 
um, to, to, to assist with promoting their tourism product, their domestic tur- tourism product. Mm-hmm. So that is what, that is what the, the Boko Reef and the, the APT James really means for you know, the Sea Bridge. I mean, they, they are absolutely high quality, beautiful state of the art ferries. We, we toured the Boko Reef um, just last week. Hmm. And, and they, they are incredible um, doing the, the journey in, in three hours or under. Mm-hmm. So, um, and, and very affordable. So, yeah, that's extremely good news for, for the domestic tourism, persons who rely on domestic tourism. I, to clar- I want you to clarify something for me here. I, there's also another favor I want you to do. I want you, since you are probably sitting at cabinet meetings, if you could whisper to the current chairman of CARICOM, to whisper to the future chairman of CARICOM, Gaston Brown, about an interregional ferry now, because I feel like it, it is something that could actually work, right? I feel like it could it would have traction, if only because I've used inter regional ferries in other parts of the world and there really is a demand for it it, it, because it's low cost for persons in any case was the nature of your to your ministry's relationship with the tourism um secretariat in tobago so how does ministry of tourism and then the to the person who's in charge of tourism for the tha how do you all interact and liaise with each other and how does it work so, under the THA Act, um, the THA is actually responsible for tourism on the island of Tobago. Mm-hmm. The oh. Ministry of Tourism is responsible for the policy direction for both Trinidad and Tobago. Um, how we interact, we, we collaborate. We collaborate in terms of our cruise tourism product. For example, when you, when you go to, to conferences, when you you speak to some of the um the cruise liners the executives etc we collaborate in terms of airlift um maybe we should talk about that the the, the, the announcement mm-hmm. by klm as mm-hmm. well i'm going to talk um, about that don't jump the gun don't, don't jump the gun we're going to talk about klm yeah. so yeah we, we we collaborate but in terms of of the law mm-hmm. and in terms of who is responsible for what the THA is responsible for, for tourism, for marketing the island, right? Um, as well as the management of the destination. Okay, so you would be more responsible, I guess, for pushing policy at the national level. At the national level, yes. Right, and then, but the THA handles its stories in Tobago. So if I want to talk about tourism in Tobago, I have to get the Secretary for Tourism from Tobago to talk about that. Who is it? You said- Yes. Right. So Ansel, if I if uh, Mr. Uh, Ansel yes. Dennis, I'd have to get him to. Oh, okay, good. I will reach out to him. Or oh, Mr. Louis Lewis, who is um in charge of the Tobago Tourism um, Authority. Authority. Okay. Right? That's right. that's the marketing um of the Tobago Tourism. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Um, yeah. KLM, as you as you raise KLM, so one of the one of someone sent in a question, and the, the the way they asked the question is not the way I want to ask the question because they asked about whether we were going to be marketing the the route to Europe. I want to look at it the other way. KLM as an airline, they're opening up a route from Port of Spain to Amsterdam. Will your ministry be looking at ways to market Trinidad and Tobago to the Dutch and to other um, nearby European countries. But that's absolutely what we have to do. So mm-hmm. it's it's from Amsterdam mm-hmm. to Barbados to Port of Spain and Port of Spain to Amsterdam. That's 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 what we're going to be focused on now is, is on and, and specifically if I could just speak plainly is is getting persons in, in Amsterdam mm-hmm. um you know hooked on on carnival mm-hmm. because they're going to be flying during the winter months. Yeah. So it's getting persons to come here for carnival and and getting tour operators to package tours where they can come go to a few fets um you know discuss and and this is this is a part of the collaboration that we will work with tobago as well mm. you come here you go to a number of fets and then you go to tobago you enjoy some some sun sea and sand and then you 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 go back home mm. so it's certainly something that i i am not focused at all on marketing anything um to to Amsterdam, of course, Amsterdam will have to do their own marketing, um, but we want uh, a considerable amount of people yeah, hooked on our culture. 
and, and wanting to come to experience our culture, experience our people. Okay, so, so that, yeah. that flight will only really be during the winter months, not during, during the, the winter Okay. During the winter months in the first. So so what, um, and, and again, kudos to the, the airport authority as well as um, Tourism Trinidad. Mm -hmm. um, those discussions, you know, begun in 2018, I think, at a Roots Americas conference where they met with the executives mm -hmm. and discussed discuss this new route and KLM were looking at expanding their route network and they said okay let's let's we've been there before let's go back to let's take a chance let's go back to Trinidad and we are going to have to take advantage of that opportunity to get persons in Amsterdam um, just hooked on our culture gotcha. and hooked on our destination um cruise ships so it's joint so it's just now so it's joint marketing yeah that, that we're to be doing with with klm um it's for the winter months but of course if we can make the case that there is a, a huge demand outside of the winter months mm -hmm. well then that would be something for klm to consider to consider if they want to expand yeah. the time from yeah. winter months into other months i get you on that because i know that this isn't necessary this isn't an, an initiative from your ministry it's klm airlines that have, they've decided that they want to do this new route and i just want to see how we are going to capitalize on this new route and i you know yeah. I, I good with it in the winter months i'll yeah. go up and have some ale and thing and walk through the red light district come back home good nice with a big with a big Trinidad and Tobago flag, right? Hey, hey. So I am going to be Trinidad. Miss. I will be Miss Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> what is wrong with you? I am going there to let people know I came for the beer, but you have to come back for the culture. Yeah. All right, I will let them know. Um, cruise ship, the cruise ship season. Are you mm. are you hopeful that we will be able to to, to launch it this year? Well, um, so 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 that's that's part that we we've been discussing. Um, I am. I am hopeful mm -hmm. um, that we can, um, you know, restart cruise tourism. Of course, we need to to immediately um, begin vaccinations of those in the tourism industry, the, the stakeholders, mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. you know it, it, it all depends on that. It depends on on confidence, and confidence depends on how well and how many of your people are vaccinated. There is actually on the itinerary, the first cruise ship is supposed to, to land in Tobago on August 10th. Mm -hmm. But of course, that is all dependent on whether we reopen the borders or not. In the, in the tourism, in the cruise tourism sector, there was some other happy news. And the happy news was that we were able to, to attract Royal Caribbean back to our shores. Oh, good. And they were making several stops. They had announced us on the itinerary last year. Um, but they are scheduled to return to Trinidad and, and Tobago, um, you know, and, and, and much kudos to, to Mr. Cavallo, who is, who is the shipper's agent. He, he does a lot and he goes out of his way to market, um, you know, our destination, our cruise destinations. Um, so that was some, some more happy news. We need to, at the, at the ministry, we are also looking at developing our cruise product. So cruise is a bit different. The cruise ship docks in here at six o'clock and persons come off the ship at eight o'clock and they come on to your island for until for about eight hours mm -hmm. and then they go back onto the ship and the ship leaves. So it's about getting a number of attractions and selling tours that they can attend. Within that eight-hour time period. Within that eight hours. So it, it, it means that they really can't go down Icarcus or they can't go too far. They can't go to the Pitch Lake, you know. Um, it's really right there in, in Port of Spain. You know, so far... Or, they, they or along the Spain. corridor, in all fairness, or along the corridor. You can do a couple or of along things. The, they they yeah. go to Asa Wright. Yeah. They go to Asa Wright. They go to Lopino as well. Um, but we, we, we're working on packaging and... and positioning the destination as different from all the others because in all the other destinations when they stop off on islands coming down to trinidad and tobago they all get the beach and the sun sea and sand and that mm -hmm. caribbean vibe mm -hmm. so um with the with the tourism culture and arts now together mm -hmm. it presents an opportunity to to use some of our performing spaces to use our our culture practitioners to put on some different shows, you know, give them a little juve experience, 
or put them in in Napa, for example, to 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 see a, a theatrical performance mm-hmm. or some extent or some old time calypso. Um, there have been there's there's talk of collaboration with NCC to put on a, a carnival village, which would be similar to the Carifesta village right. that was next to the, the Queen's Park um, Savannah. Mm-hmm. So those are the things that we are working on because the aim is to get more and more people off of the ship onto your island and spending money spending foreign exchange on your island so you know queen's hall is on board so that's that's we're working on you know redeveloping our product or tourism product for when the cruisers come to our islands okay because as it as as it stands they they go to the they do a walking tour mm-hmm. they go to the botanical oh. gardens um they walk along the magnificent seven sometimes they they get lost and end up going down charlotte street up on that but i mean charlotte street is is being redeveloped as as chinatown etc so mm-hmm. it will be um an attraction that they can simply walk to um and yeah that, that's that's what we're working on i'm gonna close off with youth um youth involvement in the tourism sector there is uh, an entirely new ministry now youth affairs and national service i think I, 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 yeah. I right. Foster, Mr. Foster Cummings. Yes, where 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 um um MP Foster Cummings is the is the minister of. I have not yet had the opportunity to interview him. I did reach out to him and he said that he was willing and he, he would find some space in his schedule. But I'm gonna ask a question to you from your end. Has your ministry considered or taken on board or willing to look at the possibility of using the tourism sector as a way to allow young people to contribute to national service? So like a national service plan that that involves tourism so that they can learn or be part of different aspects of tourism. Um, by offering national service. So whether it's as tour guides or whether as as people who are booking events, planners, that sort of thing. So that way they're getting some sort of experience in the sector and can feed the sector in terms of human resource and ideas. Yeah, I mean, um, it's it's an important consideration, Mm. getting young people involved. Um, I think, you know, as you put it, I'm thinking education because Mm -hmm. we've not really been a traditional tourism destination so many persons still we understand what it takes to be a tourist we understand what it takes to go abroad to miami or to new york or whatever but we don't really understand what it takes to be a host country Mm. we don't understand you know how you know we build how we build the tourism industry which is really just a number of services that cater to persons who travel to your destination. We don't understand that fully. Um, in fact, when you come into the Minister, Ministry of Tourism and doing a lot of the research is where you understand, wow, this tourism industry is incredibly massive. It is incredibly complex. Um, and it really takes some understanding. So in terms of education, that is important. But I'll tell you this. Uh, one, when the cruise season arrives, we hire a number of young people, a number of young people in the universities doing it, languages especially. Um, we hired quite a number of them, um, engage them, teach them about the tourism uh, sector, about cruise tourism, and we utilize them as translators. Because mm. a number of our people come from, from Europe. Uh, they speak different languages and, and we need them as translators and as tour guides. But I'll tell you that quite a number of the more exciting tour operators are actually young people. Rome TT, um, Candy Coated Experiences. Mm-hmm. These people, um, they are tour operators in their own right. Getting them, working with them to understand that, you know, it, it doesn't only have to be with domestic tourism and, and assisting them in getting towards and getting in contact with some of the travel promoters in other countries, getting them in the room with Caribbean Airlines, for example, Mm -hmm. where they can build their own tour operators, their own experiences, um, and and sell directly to to persons abroad. So we are working with young people in that regard. Mm -hmm. But I think um, 
in terms of working with Minister Foster Cummings is 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 under is getting young people to understand, you know, what the tourism sector is all about and how you you can earn a good living and create value in the tourism sector. Mm -hmm. oh. Closing question for you. How are you looking at the importance and relevance of your ministry to building cultural confidence in, in our society? Because you touched on it there when you, you talked about education and young people. So how are you, how are you seeing your role as, in, as building cultural confidence in our society? When you say cultural confidence, what, what do you mean? Our own personal confidence in our culture. It's something that became, it became pretty clear to me in this pandemic. Not like it wasn't clear before, but like it hit home hard during the pandemic and the various stages of restrictions and lockdowns that Trinidadians and Tobagonians, well, me, let me talk about Trinidadians because Tobagonians will probably say they'll lump us in with that. Trinidadians seem to be quite invested in wanting to see the country fail or some Trinidadians, or a, a too, too, too large an amount of Trinidadians in my mind, because there's so many negative things that are said, the ways in which we treat our tourism facilities here, the amount of trash we leave all over the place, whether it's on a beach, at a river. I mean, the rivers must be signed with relief that an entire year has passed without human activity. Um, so I was just wondering how you saw yourself and your ministry as playing a role in developing confidence in the culture that we have to offer the rest of the world. Because we have a lot to offer the rest of the world. But sometimes I wonder if we see the value of what we have here. Right. So that is a difficult one. But let me give you this quick story that I give quite a number of people. Mm -hmm. So we live in Trinidad we know the type of music that they play on the radio station and we know that in trinidad we tend to to love and adopt other cultures mm -hmm. very easily mm -hmm. i was fortunate enough to go to uh, an fcca uh conference which is the a cruise conference where all the cruise executives all the destinations meet up in puerto rico san juan puerto rico mm -hmm. and we have those discussions we try to to get cruise liners more and more calls to, to our destination and out of that actually is is where we got the royal caribbean but something stood out to me at that um, cruise conference so all the destinations in the caribbean were at that crew at that cruise conference and they had all their pavilions and all their little boots and everything set up and every single destination outside of Jamaica, every single destination were marketing, steel pan, soca music, moko jambi. So they were marketing us. <laughs> limbo. Every single one. And then I started to discuss with, with other persons and, and it was only then I realized that our culture is dominant throughout the Caribbean save and accept for Jamaica. Mm -hmm. In fact, mm -hmm. Jamaica's largest market for their culture, their music, outside of Jamaica is Trinidad. We have given our culture to the rest of the Caribbean, freely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To the point where the rest of the Caribbean, and I'm talking Bahamas, Cayman, everybody up there, mm -hmm. to the point where they, they utilize every aspect of their culture in their own tourism product and in marketing their own tourism and that gave me a tremendous source of pride mm -hmm. and i wondered whether i was just bebe and didn't understand it or whether it is that you know a lot of us trinis trinbegonians we too don't understand how powerful a product and a culture that we do have. I don't think we I grasp mean, it. I don't think we understand it. I don't think we appreciate it. And I don't feel that we are confident about it. Because you see that point you made there about Jamaica? Jamaicans are confident about Jamaican culture, you know. They wear it. Yeah. They speak. I mean, you know, you, you can't get past Jamaican culture once you're around a Jamaican. But Trinidadians, yeah. I know, somehow we feel like we had to apologize for we culture. Or adopt somebody else's own. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at, at music from, from Nigeria, music from all over, where they're talking about wine and whining. And yeah. so, you know, well, we are dominant 
in, in terms of that, I don't think we understand it. And in our my recent discussions with on different platforms with Second Star and, and other people, I'm saying that coming out of this pandemic, one of the things that we have to do is we have to develop a campaign mm -hmm. where we become these cultural super spreaders, mm -hmm. where we just have to be. And it's not about money. We can't want money for every single thing. We need to take it upon ourselves to just push very boldfacedly, mm -hmm. very ruthlessly, push our culture and be proud of our culture and push it at any opportunity that we have. Whether it is wearing a, a national, you know, a national flag. Like the, like the polo you have on there right now? Like the polo I have on, right? Um, whether it is putting in the bandana on your hand, every time you do an interview, you talk about Trinidad and you talk about it passionately. We need to become cultural super spreaders. We mm -hmm. need to put mm -hmm. out more and more and more content. Um, we, and, and that's something that we need to do in terms of coming out of the pandemic. Something that we're also working on is we have to develop some further incentives and one of the one of the incentives that we're working on is um a cultural a, a creative tax allowance that gives an incentive to to corporate trinidad and tobago for investing in festivals mm. because we need more and more festivals um at present you know you get tax exempt uh, exemptions for uh sorry you get tax allowances for investing in, in, in sporting, the sporting arena, um, as well as investing into artists, investing into film. But we need to, to, to get those incentives coming the way of investing into to festivals, where we could put on more and more festivals, where we need to become cultural super spreaders. Well, that's where I'll let us, that's where I'll wrap this up, us becoming cultural super spreaders. So we're going to let you be patient zero. You are going to be the first super spreader. You are going to be the patient that starts it off. Get, yeah. get the policy drivers within your ministry, the technocrats within your ministry, to understand that the most important thing they can do at this point in time is to get us to be more confident about our culture. Yeah. And mm -hmm. as I wrap it up, I asked you for an hour. So, so, you gave me an hour so and 30 time, minutes. <laughs> yeah, so the, so, so the next time that you, you advertise our discussion using the stoops for the national flag next day, right? I will. <laughs> I will. As a matter of fact, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get my graphic, because I couldn't get my graphic artist today, but I will get my graphic, gra graphic artist to do the strips and have like the national flag come out when you do the strips, <laughs> right? So it'll do... Mm. <laughs> Thank you so much, Minister Thank Mitchell. Thank you for having me. No, it's, it's, it was lovely. It was great. I'm glad that we finally had the time to have this conversation and that, it, you know, it was wide ranging. There's so many different things we covered here today. Yeah. And as soon as I right, find more hard questions to ask you, I will invite you back on. Anytime, man. I'm happy to be, I'm happy to qualify to be on this program. <laughs> you could mama guy, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> All right. You now, take care. We're, we're working hard. We are working hard to get things to, 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 to see a way past this pandemic mm -hmm. and to, to return normal and to what it comes down to increase our contribution to, to GDP, increase the value creation in the tourism mm -hmm. and in the mm -hmm. culture and art sectors. Yeah. So that's mm -hmm. where we're at. It takes all of us. Thank you for having me again. No problem. I like the idea of the culture super spreader. I really like that idea. Yeah. Ha have a good evening. Take care. All right. Enjoy your week. And there you have it, folks. Minister Mitchell, Tur Minister of Tourism, Culture and the Arts. I hope you all enjoyed the interview. And I will see you all on Wednesday. On Wednesday, we have carded tentatively the Minister of Foreign Affairs and CARICOM. Right? Minister Amy Brown. So, I look forward to seeing you all on Wednesday. Wednesday.